Today we're going to discuss heat flow. This is 7 Minutes of BS. Building science with a beat. I'm Dan Morrison, editor of Pro Tradecraft. Heat flow is the movement of heat energy between objects from a hot temperature to a cold temperature. And that is Jonathan Smeagol from RDH Building Science Laboratories. We know that heat moves from hot to cold, but it's not always clear on how it moves. So it moves in one of three ways, either by conduction, convection, or radiation. More often than not, though, heat is moving in more than one way at once. Conduction is probably the best understood of the three, and it's simply the transfer of heat through molecular contact, which is just the geeky way of saying when two things of different temperatures are in contact with each other, and you get heat transfer from hot to cold. Um, for example, if you pick up a hot pan, uh, the heat transfers to your fingers from the pan, and you get burned. If you stick your tongue against a cold metal pole in the winter, then the heat from the surface of your tongue transfers very quickly to the pole, and you end up freezing your tongue directly to the pole. So if you learn nothing else from this podcast, learn this. Always, no, wait, never touch your tongue to a cold flagpole. So that's conduction, and and like I said, it's usually the easiest to understand. Convection is a process of moving heat through fluids. In construction, those fluids are usually air or water. So in a lot of cases, we have pumps that move heated fluid into radiators or radiant floors. So that's the majority of the water part. Let's look at air, the majority of convective activity through the building enclosure. And even for what might seem like small air flows, especially in a well-insulated enclosure, this convection, this air movement through the building will dominate the heat loss across the enclosure. Dominate the heat loss across the enclosure. Dominate the heat loss across the enclosure. That's an important point that answers the why it matters question, and we'll come back to that in a bit. The fluid convection talked about earlier is what's called forced convection, because there were pumps, fans, or some kind of mechanical power behind the movement. Another example of convection would be what we call natural convection. So because warm air is less dense and cooler air is more dense, we often get stratification of air and movement against surfaces. Natural convection is when air moves based on the temperature difference. As the air cools, it will become denser, it will fall and be replaced by warmer, less dense air. For example, if you're standing against a large window, the air in the room will cool as it comes in contact with that window and it will fall down the surface of the window, often leading to condensation in the bottom corners. Just like the convective current that rolls past your window and drops condensation at the bottom, Little convective loops in the stud cavities can mean little lumps of water in your wall. Also, within wall assemblies, within enclosures, in air permeable insulation, if you don't do a good job installing insulation in your your stud cavities, you can get convective looping in your stud cavities. Okay, that's the high and low on convective heat flow, fluids carrying heat. The last form of heat transfer is radiation. Radiation heat transfer is a bit more complicated to understand because because you can't observe it in the ways that you can observe conduction or convection. Radiation can go through clear surfaces such as windows, it can go through vacuums like space and vacuum insulated panels, but it cannot go through solid objects. The most obvious, important, and probably easy to understand example of radiant heat flow is the sun. In thermal envelope world, that heat can be either wanted or unwanted, depending on the season and where you live. In general, people don't understand radiative heat transfer as well. When it comes to radiation heat transfer and the opaque enclosure, there could be confusion in how radiant barriers, foils, low E coatings on surfaces can work. I happen to know that there's a whole podcast on the topic of radiant barriers, so dig into that if you're still hungry. The radiation heat transfer is simply two surfaces of different temperature that are radiating through space to each other to try and even out the temperature difference between those two surfaces. If you have a warm surface and a cold surface and they can see each other, they will try to come to an equilibrium temperature by radiating heat or cold to each other. For example, when you stand next to a cold wall or window, you feel the cold even without touching it because your heat is radiated away. The cold wall sucks heat away from you. It literally sucks to be standing there. So if you touch the cold wall, that's conduction. If you feel a cold draft coming off the wall, that's convection. When you feel the heat sucked out of you, that's radiation. Even though all three of these modes are relatively straightforward when it comes to the enclosure buildings and enclosure components, all three modes of heat flow work simultaneously. 
Usually, though, one form is dominant over the others. Which can make it difficult to understand exactly what's going on with heat transfer. The three modes of heat transfer could change as heat moves through a wall assembly, and they would end up acting in series in some walls or even in parallel, depending on the type and complexity of the wall system. To illustrate, Jonathan sketches out a bare concrete wall with no insulation above ground on a sunny day. Let's just say we have a concrete exterior wall. It's concrete all the way through from the interior to the exterior. There's no insulation, just to simplify this example. And so we have the radiation from the sun coming down the building and heating up the surface of the concrete. So that's radiative heat transfer from the sun to the exterior surface of the concrete. From there, the concrete gets quite warm, as you would expect, and the heat transfer through the concrete itself is largely and almost entirely by conduction. There's not a lot of spaces in that concrete for convection or radiation heat transfer. But when the heat gets to the other side, it changes again. To radiation again, but... And now it's a different radiation than when the sun was radiating. It's an infrared spectrum radiation, a much lower temperature. Whereas the radiation from the sun was in the ultraviolet spectrum, a much hotter spectrum to sit in. But the heat doesn't stop with infrared radiation. The heated interior surface of the concrete, once again, creates convection currents. So that surface will heat up, it will cause the air adjacent to that surface to rise, and you will get radiative and convective heat transfer off the interior of that surface. So just in that very simple example of a concrete wall, we have all three methods of heat transfer working to move heat from the exterior to the interior space. In pretty much any place that a building will be made of concrete walls, there's going to be a need to insulate those concrete walls. A common way to insulate that concrete wall is on the interior, put on steel studs, fiberglass bat, and interior gypsum board. So what happens then? Well, we have the sun heating the wall, the wall getting warm, the heat moving to the interior surface. But instead of radiating directly to the interior now, steel studs in direct contact with that concrete are warmed by conduction. Concrete heats up, studs are in contact, we have molecular contact, and we have heat transferred to the studs. In between the steel studs, we do have some fiberglass bat, which do a pretty good job of insulating the concrete. It re they really limit the conduction, the radiation, and the convection between the spaces. But this is a prime example of defective R-value losses as a result of thermal bridging of steel studs. All of the heat will be conducted around the insulation to the interior surface of the drywall, and that is where you have your radiation and convective heat transfer. To reiterate, the majority of the heat flows around the insulation through the steel studs and it heats up the drywall. All three types of heat flow work together to move heat, and each type's proportion of importance depends on the assembly, where the heat is located within the assembly, and where the assembly is located within the world. In colder climates, heat flow reductions are typically done by specifying higher R values of insulation and higher air tightness values to minimize both the largest sources of conduction and convection heat loss. Windows are predominantly important for heat loss in cold climates, whereas in hot climates, they're the main source of heat gain. So they sabotage boilers in the north and AC units in the south. In the warmer, more southern climate, solar control is typically the key to thermal control and comfort. Air tightness is important, but as a generalization, air tightness is not as critical, and the R value levels do not need to be as high to maintain interior comfort. Radiant barriers in the roof assembly, shading, and low E coatings on windows is how radiant heat flow is slowed. So knowing how to stop the flow is one aspect of solving the puzzle. Knowing why helps to dial in the strategy. The biggest reason to control heat flow in buildings is actually for occupancy comfort. If you can control drafts, you can eliminate complaints about drafts. You'll also reduce condensation problems which can lead to musty air and rotten wood. Controlling heat flow also saves money for whoever pays the utility bills. A better thermal envelope means that you can cut down the size of the mechanical equipment that heat and cool the building. The operational energy savings are critical because once you finish the building, they're the main cost that you have to operate that building for the entire life of the building. So if you can minimize the operational costs right off the bat, then for 50, 75, 100 years, you're going to keep saving money year after year. And that's a pretty smart approach to building design. Turns out, you get paid for what you do and what you know. When you know more, you can do more.